welcome you to today's event, uh, and thank you for attending this discussion on this important topic. My name is Akhil Haider. I'm the Middle Eastern Affairs Advisor uh, with the European Union Association. The EU Association helps promote multilateral relations with EU global partners and uh, for a better understanding of EU prior priorities and policies in the United States and the United Nations. We also help raise awareness and understanding of various global social and economic issues. The event is organized today by the EU Association with the support of the Division of Social Policy and Development, ESPD, and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, DESA, at the United Nations. We are very lucky to have a highly distinguished experts panel today to discuss this very important subject, the humanitarian refugee crisis in the Mediterranean Sea area. It's an unfolding tragedy, a strat or a tragedy that is arising from the refugees escaping uh, from the troubled area in the Middle East and the Sub-Saharan Africa in desperate attempts to reach the European shores, putting their lives at risk and adding mounting pressure on the coastal Mediterranean cities in Europe. An, un an un unfortunate reality uh, that, we all, that the world community needs to address um, and deal with. Um, so we are honored today to be holding this event at the United Nations headquarters and more honored to have such an esteemed panel of international and on-site experts to discuss this topic. Um, as you can see, we actually have connections with Italy from Sicily, the coastal Mediterranean city of Sicily, um, as well as from Skype. And uh, our panel today here uh, attending the event, uh, who will be our speakers today, um, are Ms. Amy, Ms. Amy Mugin, Program Specialist, Office of the Program Observer of the, at the United Nations International Organization for Migration. Uh, Ms. Grania O'Hara, uh, Senior Policy Advisor with, United, uh, with the UNSCR, which is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, Ms. Uh, Laura uh, Igodi, uh, First Council of Humanitarian Affairs from the Permanent Mission of Italy to the United Nations. Um, he was holding, I think, the presidency uh, right now, uh, the EU Commission. Uh, Professor Renato Accorinti uh, from uh, is a civil society ex uh, civil society activist and the mayor of the city of Messina in Italy. Um, and we also have um, on-site um, activist and humanitarian humanitarian affairs activist in charge of coordinating and welcoming refugees uh, in the hosting centers in uh, in Sicily. Um, and around the Mediterranean as well, who hopefully will be able to join us and give us some overview. Um, as I said, we're really honored to have you here today. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, we're really looking forward to understand the scale and the scope of the, of, of the, of the crisis that we're having here um, and understand a little bit more what can be done as well. So without any further ado, uh, I defer to our uh, panel experts and um, um, we can um, start with whoever wants to start. <laughs> and if, if you don't mind, give a little bit about, about yourself and, and sort of your role and uh, uh, to start with, that would be excellent. Thank you so much. Um, hi, good afternoon and, and good evening and I would like to thank um, the association for inviting IOM to participate. In this very important briefing, my name is Amy Muden. I'm with the International Organization for Migration, our permanent observer mission here at the United Nations. IOM is um, the leading intergovernmental organization with a mandate solely on migration, covering all aspects of migration um, needs, issues, challenges, opportunities since 1951, working in many places in close partnerships with our sister organization, UNHCR. Um, I'm just going to give a brief um, overview, a snapshot maybe of the situation and some suggested areas for, for response and for consideration in the region. And I just want to recall that last October, the UN General Assembly met for only the second time to have a high-level dialogue on international migration and developments, where they were looking at ways in which migration can contribute to development so long as the human rights of migrants were promoted and protected. And that event on its opening day was marked by the deaths of over 350 migrants off the coast of Lampedusa. And those numbers have continued to grow as we saw over this past weekend that there were another 30 migrant deaths in a fishing boat carrying over 600 people between the, the coast of Libya and Sicily. Since the beginning of this year, we're approaching figures of nearly 60,000 migrants and asylum seekers who arrived in Italy by sea compared to last year's total figures of 42,000. Now, it's, it's very interesting to see that when, when we hear the news about this, it's, it's looking at the tragedy of what's happened. But really, it's only giving us one small snapshot of their entire journey 
and process. And it's not recognizing, per se, the transformations that occur in terms of their migration process. Um, a person who may have started out as an asylum seeker might wind up being smuggled or trafficked, or a person or an economic migrant who's trying to find entry into other countries winds up becoming a victim of trafficking. And these tragedies strike within a, a broader systemic challenge to migration management, where it's not the responsibility of one, but it's the responsibility of many to come and respond to this and requires further engagement and cooperation of many stakeholders, governmental, intergovernmental, uh, non-governmental, uh, civil society, organizations, NGOs, and of course, migrants themselves. We've seen over the past few years a number of major population movements due to a lot of uh, political and social transformations that have been occurring in the Middle East and North Africa, and of course with the ongoing conflict in Syria that's spurring population movements. But what's important to recognize is that a lot of these population movements comprise of complex mixed migration flows. And by that I mean it's, it's several categories of people, whether they are asylum seekers, refugees, economic migrants, victims of trafficking, smuggled migrants, or unaccompanied minors. And some of them do have um, international legal protections afforded to them. But in any case, we should look at all of them and their specific needs and vulnerabilities, which must be addressed. Now, we've seen with a lot of these complex migration flows that it's placed a lot of significant pressure on the response capacities of the EU's southern border, particularly Italy, with regard to search and rescue at sea, with reception, with processing asylum claims, with responding to the needs of these groups of people. And we've also noticed that in the past few years that we've seen enhanced border controls, perhaps tightening of visa regimes, criminalizing irregular migrants, that this has not necessarily led to decreased migration by any means, but instead that migrants will find other ways of entry. And oftentimes this might mean that they may turn to criminal networks that engage in smuggling and trafficking. So it's really the time now for states to explore other ways of managing migration, including through the possibility of legal entry channels. And one of the first things that governments can do is to have a consultation, including all, all countries, not just the countries of destination, but also the countries of origin and transit, to, to renew efforts and commitments to, to look at ideas in terms of entry, relocation, or resettlements. And let me just put this into a little bit of perspective, that the UN estimates that there's 232 international million migrants in the world today that account for about 3% of the world's population. And this number is, is continuing to grow. So one of the um, immediate areas uh, in which governments and other stakeholders can respond is with search and rescue. And of course, we welcome and really applaud the operations of Mare Nostrum for its increased patrolling in the area since, since last October. And, and the, the operation has reported that um, deaths in the Mediterranean have actually decreased so far, to the best of our knowledge. In 2013, we know of some 700 migrants who were lost at sea. And so far this year, we're, we're only able to account for 50. Now again, these numbers might be very conservative because these are the, the, the numbers that we know about and not for all the people that, that we don't know about. Migrant arrivals. Migrant arrivals for regular migration should also be decriminalized. And penalties for commercial and private ships assisting migrants should be abolished. Further efforts can be given for rules of engagement in terms of search and rescue, including a safe port for disembarkments. Another avenue is the establishment of migrant centers in transit countries. And I don't want to be misunderstood that the, I'm not talking about migrant detention centers, but I'm talking about centers that provide assistance to migrants, whether it's counseling, referral, screening, finding ways in which they may be able to resettle in other countries, family reunification cases, awareness raising on the risks of irregular migration, as well as training for government officials and civil society to help identify vulnerable cases and assist them. Looking at ways in which family reunification, relocation, and resettlement into third countries can also be explored. 
humanitarian access visas. Other countries in the past, even outside of this region, have considered this in special considerations. Assistance and referral net frameworks are important. The Presidium model that IOM does jointly with UNHCR and the Italian Red Cross and Save the Children, where we provide assistance to authorities to help receive, identify, and counsel vulnerable groups as they were uh, arrive out in accordance with their human rights principles, looking into ways in which we can engage diaspora organizations as well as host communities to help respond to post-arrival needs. Reception capacities in a number of places are often not in the best conditions. We hear a lot of talk about how migrants bring disease, when oftentimes migrants who endure these journeys are actually quite strong and healthy, and it's once they arrive in some of these these centers that they are faced with inhumane conditions that affect their physical and mental health. Assisted voluntary return and reintegration for those who opt to return home where it's safe and viable, where assistance can be provided to them. And of course, capacity building of governmental and civil society actors to help, to help identify asylum seekers and refugees through protection-sensitive border procedures, but also to help provide community-based information and sensitization materials and mechanisms. And of course, this would also be helped by data collection in terms of finding out more about these migration flows, not just the numbers, but the, the purpose, the reasons where these migrants are coming for, from, their purpose for migration, when, how long they have been as a part of this journey, a journey um, their family members that they've left behind, the impacts on them, where is, what is their ultimate goal, where is the ultimate destination for them. Those are some of the immediate things we could look at. But of course there are bigger policy issues that have to be addressed as well, and that's looking at the public and political discourse on migration. Now we saw a couple of months ago the elections of the European Parliament where there were several right-wing parties that rode a wave of anti-immigrant sentiment, and they were very popular in the elections. And I think this is really a role for the electorate, for civil society organizations, to help confront and challenge this anti-immigrant uh, discourse by providing facts, by providing information, by looking at ways in which migrants actually contribute to host and origin countries. And, and another bigger um, policy area to discuss is looking at ways in which migration can actually help contribute to human development. <laughs> and, and in one avenue, governments should consider ways of mainstreaming migration into their national development or poverty reduction plans, addressing both the root causes of migration as well as reintegration measures for returning migrants, which has become essential. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the General Assembly met for only the second time having this high-level dialogue on international migration and development. So there's already this recognition by a number of member states that there is this intrinsic link if migration is well managed and if the human rights of migrants are upheld. A longer-term solution for, for migrants should be, should be addressed, including return and reintegration where necessary, or regularization and integration. And by integration, I, I just want to clarify that integration is a two-way process. It does not mean assimilation, but it does mean a give and take by both the migrants and the host community in terms of acceptance of each other. Of course, initiatives <coughs> aimed at improving economic opportunities in countries or host or origin communities and looking at avenues, looking further down the road, looking at avenues for safe uh, labor migration, looking at the skill set of labor, of labor migrants and looking where they might be most able to contribute in certain labor markets or in certain countries. I think I'll just leave it at there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. And uh, do that again. Thank you so much uh, for this overview. Uh, this was very helpful. Uh, we will have a Q and uh, in a session at the end of the um, uh, of our uh, discussion uh, to allow the uh, questions from the audience. Now, on their overview of the situation.
this one. And good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Gronio O'Hara. I work in the liaison office here in New York of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And thanks to the organizers, thanks for your presence here and the interest you're showing in this topic. And Amy and I, um, we, we often participate on, on the same panel. We've become something of a, of a double act when it comes to the whole question of, of the broader context of migration and then within that the interface to specific international protection needs of refugees and asylum seekers. And, and one of the joys of participating on a panel with Amy is she's always so well prepared and she does a great overview, which means that I can be very brief because there's just a couple of additional framing comments I wanted to make and I think that will be great um, in in view of you know reserving the time to hear also from the practitioners we have online who have the direct operational experience of what it means to be at the receiving end of all the arrivals that, that are currently coming to the shores of Italy. So just uh, very briefly some framing remarks and uh, picking up from a lot of what Amy was saying about the general context of migration and then trying to move that also with a focus on international protection needs. And um, we just passed now on the 20th of, of June um, World Refugee Day and every year on the occasion of World Refugee Day our High Commissioner issues the new um, statistics and trend information on the state of play globally with um, forced displacement. And this year's figures were extremely sobering. Um, we have 51.2 million people forcibly displaced globally. This counts for refugees, IDPs, I mean it's, it's forcible displacement in a number of different contexts. This is the highest that numbers have reached for forcible displacement since the end of the Second World War. So we are really in a phase right now these last few years with mega crises like Syria, Central African Republic, South Sudan, Libya not so long ago in the not too distant past where we are faced with very, very large numbers of, of people on the move. And interestingly enough, our statistics also revealed, and here I'm talking about the period 2012-2013, our statistics on global trends at the same time as revealing this, this huge spike in the numbers of forcibly displaced also revealed that we had hit a very low number in terms of voluntary repatriation. So we're seeing a lot more people on the move than we are seeing it matched by appropriate durable solutions. Another very shocking thing about those figures was the fact that uh, in the period 2012-2013, making up a total of 51.2 million, we had 10.7 million people newly displaced in that year alone. And that reflects the type of huge crises of, that I mentioned, Syria, Central African Republic, Sudan, and many of these uh, nationalities we, as we move on into our discussion, we'll see that several of these nationalities tend to feature very prominently in the departure waves that are taking place from Libya at arrivals in, um, in Italy. And when we move to look at the whole context of maritime movements globally and the significance of maritime dynamics as part of this greater flow of the forcibly displaced, I mean, there's, there's essentially four principal maritime routes globally. You have the movement of um, of Haitians and Cubans in the Caribbean, you have the movement from the Horn of Africa towards Yemen um, in the, the Middle Eastern region, you have a, a major maritime route on uh, Southeast Asia where you have a lot of people moving towards Australia and very significantly and obviously most important to our discussion today, you have the, Carib the Mediterranean dynamics. And the numbers in the Mediterranean are definitely significantly on the rise. The figures for Italy, which Amy cited, are, are clear uh, factual evidence of that. Um, Italy, in terms of being a receptor globally of asylum seekers, Italy ranks number nine of the top ten countries of asylum seekers globally, and a lot of this has to do with the maritime dynamics. Now, let me make a small brackets here so I'm not misleading with the numbers. This does not mean that Italy is number nine in the world of countries receiving refugees. Here I'm talking about asylum seekers, I'm talking about people who are going into an individualized, formalized application process to determine their international protection needs. So in that context, Italy ranks number nine alongside the top ranker there, in case you're interested, is Germany followed by the United States. And it goes down through the ranks with Italy number nine and followed number ten by Switzerland. The largest 
receivers of refugees in the mass numbers. I mean, there you're looking at countries like Lebanon, you're looking at uh, Turkey in the context of the Syria travel. But I think the figures for Italy are very significant and they reflect the pressures, the immense pressures that are being put on the Italian asylum system as a result of the increase in the maritime dynamics. Um, I wanted to make one small comment about um, terminology because I do think terminology in this debate is extremely important. Not that we need to get overly hung up on terminology, but Amy spoke in a, in a very good introduction about the broad dynamics of migration. Um, I'm sometimes baffled when I look at some of the media coverage and I see in, a, in an article, for example, um, how freely the terms migrant, refugee, everything is all mixed up. I'm particularly baffled when I, uh, when I read a sentence that says, you know, there was a rescue and 200 Syrian migrants were rescued. I mean, in our view, there are a number of nationalities which quite clearly have international protection needs on the basis of where they are originating from and what they are fleeing from. So in the context of the discussion we're having, terminology does have a significance. And um, everybody who is on the move on these hazardous trips across the Caribbean, I beg your pardon, Caribbean was my former duty station and I tend to mix up the two seas. Across the Mediterranean, everybody has human rights entitlements, everybody. So I'm not trying to suggest with this focus in terminology that we're saying that, you know, refugees are up there and they are somehow better than the others. That, that's not at all what I'm saying. Everybody has human rights needs and as I'm sure we'll hear from the colleagues who are at the operational receiving end, some of the human rights needs and the, the physical material needs of people arriving can be quite stark and dramatic. So we have this, this great number of people that have a shared need for for protection in the common sense use of that word, respect for their human rights. But within those groups on the move, we do have individuals that having gone through an asylum procedure would potentially be recognized as refugees and that would put them in a different category in terms of legal protection. So just an underlining there about the, um, about the, the terminology. And more generally, what's clear from the dynamics of what's happening in the Mediterranean is that there is a need for coherent policy responses. And here I could not echo more loudly Amy's um, words where she was talking about the need for integrated policy responses, where you have different actors coming so that the policy response ends up being coherent. And it looks at the entire continuum of the migration journeys, the travels, the paths that people have taken before they reach Italy. Because you cannot have a coherent policy that looks at only one segment of the journey. That will not resolve, it will not ease the situation that we're all collectively trying to respond to. A coherent policy response needs to have both legislative and operational components. And here, I mean, just to underline, um, you know, some of the steps that have been taken by, by Italy, because Italy has been very proactive in terms of mobilizing um, the resources to undertake um, the rescue operations, which have been so fundamentally important to saving life at sea. Also, on the operational side on land, I mean, Italy has put a lot of efforts, including as of late last year and the publication of a decree which was aimed towards increasing the reception capacity. But as we move into the first, I mean we were all I think quite shocked at the numbers of 2013. As we move now into the first six months of 2014, the numbers are going up and up and very dramatically. And I think this past weekend where the figures hit 5,000 was I think really showing us that we're on an upward trend that this um, this issue is not going away and we need to all cooperate in finding appropriate solutions. And um, I'm going to leave it at that, in, as I said, in the interest of keeping it brief and hearing what the operational colleagues have to say from the field. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, uh, for your overview. Um, you know, we would definitely love to come back and, and, and ask you uh, later in the Q&A session of, of the nature of the interaction between UNHCR and the different countries dealing with the situation as well and, uh, you know, what, what what is being done right now. Um, so without further ado, uh, uh, we will uh, move to our next speaker, uh, who is Italy from the uh, uh, Italian Permission, uh, to, uh, to understand a little bit on the policy level, um, what, what Italy is dealing with and, and how are, they are responding to this crisis. Um, um, is there a structure in place? Um, and um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you.
Thank yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the EU Association for organizing this meeting, and thank you to IOM and UNHCR for this very interesting overview on, on your activities. I will focus a little bit more on uh, what Italy is doing, and I would also like to convey uh, the PRs and Ambassador uh, Tardi uh, congratulations for the event and best wishes for this conference. Uh, I would I would uh, start with some as well with some figures saying that during this year, more than 58,000 migrants already came to Italy, and the figure for the same period of last year was. 7,300, so like eight times less. Uh, and in um, managing these migratory flows, Italy faces uh, unprecedented challenges, as we all said. Uh, we have to secure borders while rescuing vulnerable people at sea, and, uh, uh, and very often asylum seekers or persons in need of international protection. So the, the challenge is really enormous. Uh, that what's, what's the difference now? I mean, in the past, most migrants were in search of a better life. Uh, and uh, nowadays, roughly two-thirds of arrivals to Italy are, person, are persons potentially uh, beneficiaries of international protection. So this is really, really a game-changer for us. Uh, in fact, there is a huge difference between land border controls and sea operations. Uh, migrants arriving by sea are traveling in dangerous circumstances and uh, they have suffered from long journeys and in most cases uh, they, have, uh, they have suffered of, uh, from human rights violations and, and usually, unfortunately, they are in also in <coughs> bad health conditions. Uh, going again on some figures, during 2013, over 42,000 migrants crossed the Mediterranean Sea and came to Italy through the central Mediterranean route. Uh, and it, this route accounted for 70% of the arrivals to Europe. So the main transit uh, country of this, of this uh, route uh, is, is Italy. And the starting point, of course, for the journeys uh, where often smugglers operate is, uh, is Libya. As you all know, the Libyan government is not fully in control of its territory. And uh, human rights are not systematically respected, and the main consequences of th this is that no readmission of migrants is possible in the case of Libya, in compliance with the non refoulement principle, which is really uh, a problem. Uh, Italy is therefore strongly committed to search and rescue activities, and very often far beyond its own area of responsibility. Uh, in case of need, migrants are rescued and taken to the Italian territory. And uh, again, in 2013, uh, Italy rescued more than 37,000 people, and most of them out of the Italian search and rescue area. Uh, when Lampedusa occurred, as a quick response uh, last October, uh, as you all mentioned, the Italian government has intensified the search and rescue activities, and by deploying the humanitarian mission called the Mare Nostrum, and uh, since its beginning, so we said in October, the operation has covered an area reaching 50 miles south of Lampedusa and 100 miles southeast of Sicily. And more than 43,000 migrants were rescued and 250 persons involved in smuggling and trafficking were arrested. So Mare Nostrum, we believe, is an important humanitarian mission, but of course we cannot uh, continue with this forever. And uh, since these events challenged Italy's response capabilities, we have repeatedly asked for a multilateral support, and mainly at European level. At the European Union, a particular level, we, uh, we asked to increase the capabilities of Frontex, and uh, we welcome very much the EU Task Force Mediterranean Measures to Enhance Protection Operations in cooperation with third countries while fighting against trafficking and smuggling. But of course, we all know that more has to be done, and we also believe that our national and European response should not be based only on security and police operations. It is time for us to focus on migrants' rights, as we said, and Italy is fully committed to the mainstreaming of human rights into migration policies worldwide. Uh, this is why support from the UN and UN agencies such as UNHCR and also, for example, for UNODC concerning the fight against trafficking of human beings uh, would be a very, very valuable addition, additional asset for us. 
Uh, we also need to politically to cooperate with countries of transit and origin, starting from Libya. Uh, again, Libya is in a very critical uh, situation, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to plan any kind of cooperation with the, these authorities, but we really, really have to do so, and we are deeply committed to the stability of, uh, of our neighbor. Uh, we should also uh, encourage Libya uh, and support Libya to strengthen efforts to better manage migration flows in compliance with its obligation under international law. And also, after Libya, we have to cooperate with other countries of transit that we know uh, are in mainly in, in Africa. Uh, most migrants arriving via the Central Mediterranean route come from the Horn of Africa in particular and cross uh, the sub-Saharan countries. Uh, this is a region where a possible EU initiative should be targeted and for this reason we are working with the European uh, Commission on an initiative in this area but we expect also a valuable contribution from UNHCR and the UN in general. Uh, unfortunately, serious abuses and human rights violations are reported on a daily basis uh, on these routes of migration, we will all know that. And Italy believes that the first event of the initiative uh, taken with the European Commission should tackle the issue of trafficking of human beings, with a specific focus on prevention, protection of victims and law enforcement activities, as well as on cases of gender-based uh, violence and child abuse. But we, having said that, we very much appreciate the activities that the UN uh, are doing with Italy, especially as regards the reception of migrants upon arrival in, uh, on our shores. And uh, for example, the a Presidium project is a positive example of this joint activity in, uh, in a critical area. And uh, we really be assured that we will, uh, we will uh, cooperate very much with, with you on that. And, uh, we really like to, to reiterate the support, uh, the Italian support to the High Commissioner's idea of devoting, for example, also this year's dialogue on the challenges of international protection to the protection at sea and its commitment to participating to the preparations of this important event. So this, I would stop it here and uh, we'll be, uh, be happy to hear from, from uh, activists and uh, operators on this field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, we uh, just lost the connection on Skype, so we're trying to reestablish that shortly. Um, so um, we can probably, that's going to take us a few minutes just to get that back on, so we still know that. Um, we can do that, right? Yeah, I think meanwhile, to take uh, advantage of the time, uh, we can probably open uh, the floor to questions from uh, the audience. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand, uh, push the button in front of you for the microphone, uh, and please identify yourself, the organization you work with, uh, and please keep the uh, question directed to uh, or relevant to the topic today. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience today? All right, so I guess we'll just wait on uh, the Skype uh, connection. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, good afternoon. My name is John Zutil. I'm from the European Union delegation. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for the presentations. Um, uh, very interesting and um, very useful, I find. And um, especially the numbers, you all were mentioning the numbers from the IOM, from the UNHCR, I mean, and, and also from, from the Italian representative. Clearly, numbers are going up, and uh, efforts are, are ongoing to try and, and, and do something, not just in the Mediterranean, but globally, of course. But uh, what is interesting is that um, in, in the last uh, draft uh, from the um, uh, Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals, which of course, um, uh, uh, is going to be a very important input for the uh, post 2015 development agenda, and, and which, uh, especially relating to the um, outcome document from the uh, ministerial declaration of the uh, migration event, uh, high level dialogue last year, there was a very important commitment by, by ministers to that event that. The post 2000 development, uh, post 2015 development agenda has to look at migration in a, in a much more effective way. Uh, 
in serious way. But looking at the latest draft of the Open Working Group document, I, I only saw, I mean, it only came out on, on Monday, so I only saw just two references, and one reference was very much relating to uh, migrant yeah. workers. Um, so it would be interesting to hear um, what what are the views of, and if there are any expectations, especially from uh, UNHCR and from YOM and from what this document should contain and which areas um, maybe uh, or, or these which goals uh, from the uh, 17 goals should really reflect this issue and, and provide better input for the uh, sustainable development agenda, which is yet to be agreed. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think. Excuse me. Um, it looks like we do have the connection back. And I'm sorry. Was um, there a question there? Or was. Uh, yeah, there was. All right. So. Um, there was. Is there an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, um, we also read the document, and yeah, you found yeah. one more reference to migration than I found. I could only find one, so I'm going to have to go back and reread it. Um, uh, both of our organizations have been very closely involved in the, the drafting exercise. I mean, we were very closely involved in the high-level dialogue, and it's been going. It's not just the, the open working group document. This is a, is a continuing process. And from UNHCR's perspective, and just on balance of the amount of effort we put in to the drafting exercise, we are somewhat disappointed to see where the editing has taken us, because there was a lot more reference, particularly in Area 16, about forced displacement. Now, that said, we consider this a work in progress. I mean, this process has not yet finished. So from our perspective, um, we're looking at a zero document, and we see that there's another at least a year of discussions ahead of us. And we would hope, and, and I think Amy would probably echo the sentiment, we would hope that the, the strength of sentiment that was expressed by the participants in the high-level dialogue would carry over in a more substantive context content way, because from the zero draft, it's certainly not matching the expectations that came out of the high-level dialogue. Uh, just to echo what, what Ronya has said as well, I mean, the previous iteration, I believe, had slightly more references to, to migration, and, you know, with HCR and with a number of other agencies, we're talking to a number of member states who are actively participating in the open working group. And, you know, for some of them, it's just a matter of, you know, not understanding how best to reflect migration in there. When we're talking about lowering the cost of migration, what do we mean? What do we mean beyond lowering the transaction costs of remittances? Maybe we're talking a little bit about um, recruitment costs, for example. Um, so I think there are areas there which just need to be um, clarified and, and left, you know, and not left so much as, as a mystery. Um, as Gwenda said, I mean, we'll wait to see what the formals next week, and then the last session of the Open uh, Working Group deliver, the report that they deliver. We understand that it will influence the Secretary General's report next year. And of course, it'll be interesting to see how much of the elements coming out of those reports will then really lay the groundwork for the actual negotiations for what is, what is going to be decided in, in the course of, of next year. Um, What's been hopeful, and it's mainly one of my other colleagues who follows the post-2015 discussions much more closely than I do, is that a lot of the reflection that we heard and saw at the high-level dialogue, we're hearing a lot more now as well during the open, work, open working group sessions. It's a matter of translating it effectively on, onto paper into some kind of language that is clear and understandable and, and measurable as well. Yes, and this is what it comes down to, how, how to measure. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get back to the Q&A session um, after we introduce our um, pan other panelists from Italy, uh, Professor uh, So please go ahead, Giuseppe, and introduce uh, our panelists. Yes, I would like to introduce you to uh, Renato Corinti. He is the mayor of Messina. He is also a pacifist, he is a civil society activist, he's been so for decades. In, to be honest, for us, civil society activist is the model for us in Italy. He's always been uh, active with the refugees, with the anti-war campaigns, and uh, he just won the election a year ago. 
uh, on a platform that covers specifically UN priorities, basically all of them. So we are really, um, we think he's a model that we are very much proud of having as mayor. Um, Professor Corinti, può parlare ora se vuole. You can come in. Intanto eh, un saluto a tutti, un abbraccio dalla Sicilia a tutti voi. Eh, volevo tu sei hai e tu sei hai per il dare un sesso. Io sono eh, il sindaco di questa città nel centro del Mediterraneo, un luogo straordinario. E oggi vi racconto quello che probabilmente in parte sapete. Cioè, eh, siamo in un luogo dove arrivano migliaia e migliaia di persone dall'Africa, dalla Siria, dalla Palestina, ma è una storia alla fine antica, e non è antica quanto il mondo. Perché da sempre? Perché da sempre? Scusa. I just want to tell you that I live in the middle of this city. I'm the mayor of this city, which is in the middle of the Mediterranean. So our background basically has been exposed to this kind of emergencies for a long time. We have thousands of refugees coming from Syria, from uh, Palestine, and from other countries. Uh, in the, around the Mediterranean, uh, basically, we get most of the incoming flows, so this is something that now we are we've been facing with a long time, and we are trying basically at the present time to, to address this issue as well as we can. Con i nostri occhi che vengono nelle nostre terre e questo fa sentire in un modo vivo che il problema è planetario perché arrivano in continuo sempre di più uomini, donne e bambini. Uh, yes, uh, obviously the position of the island of Sicily makes us uh, more and make us, make us more aware of the, of the problem, which is not just local, it's a planetary uh, emergency that's grown more and more. And, uh, and so we just are, in a way, exposed in a major way because of the location in which we are, and we think that we should all be basically coordinate better for uh, facing this, this uh, primary problem. Arrivano in continuo navi, anche navi container, proprio l'impatto di vedere questi nostri fratelli proprio sotto i container ed è un'immagine proprio delle merci e degli uomini sotto questi container e questo diciamo fotogramma eh, fa vedere proprio come si spostano le merci e come viene mercificato anche l'essere umano. Yes, uh, one of the most traumatic spectacles or, 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 or experience that we get when they see these incoming refugees getting into our cities that they often be brought over from overseas in container ships. And even the image associated with this is very discomforting because, as you will know, there is a, a trade of human beings going on right now. And it's, it's extremely sad, not only in symbolism, but in real, reality, our brothers like this have to go through such humiliation and, and endure such, such incredible conditions. <laughs> a cominciare dai volontari perché suscita un grande senso di umanità il, le persone che arrivano e perciò c'è un impegno veramente straordinario anche senza tanti soldi ma c'è uno sforzo umano di tante persone ma questo non basta e ora vorrei parlarvi tra poco invece di quello che penso di, del flusso di persone che arrivano qui well, and first of all, I'd like to point out the, the great sacrifices that are being made by the NGO community, the volunteers that have given so much uh, effort with little or no resources, and, uh, and this is something that should be commended, really. Uh, and in, in, I would like to also discuss with you some more details of this, uh, this tragedy 
and, uh, and uh, I will share this with you right away. Guardate questo è l'ultima fotogramma di un film. Importante vedere da quando parte il film. E il film parte dall'egoismo dell'Occidente che fa da sempre politiche devastanti e predatorie verso il terzo mondo, rubando il futuro e tutte quelle che sono le loro risorse. Poi vediamo la parte finale quando loro scappano, arrivano qua e c'è la nostra quasi pietà di fare qualunque cosa per loro. What obviously what I would like to point out is that we only see the last part of a of a, of a really bad movie when we see these, these people come over in such uh, inhumane conditions. But clearly, we should look at the raw reasons and origins of this problem, and that's given by sometimes it's quite often from the uh, selfishness of some major powers, including some of the Western powers historically, which uh, have, have often caused the root reasons why this is happening with other international actors, obviously, and uh, we should begin to address. If the reasons why this problem is happening and what can be done in the roof really of the problem. The banchi, the fasce dei bambini, delle donne, degli uomini e la conoscenza anche di molte vittime che restano in fondo al mare è veramente ormai una realtà e questa realtà viene battuta in faccia a tutti noi e perciò dobbiamo finalmente svegliarci dall'egoismo del mondo ricco verso il mondo più povero. The, the greatness of the tragedy is summarized, especially looking at all these children and the defenseless people that come over and with such uh, incredible necessities. And this should awake our conscience in understanding the selfishness that often is being proven by who has the means to help the developing world and third world countries. Uh, and often we probably don't do as much as we could, at least from the, from the developed world, and this should be a motivating factor to be more sensitive to their needs. Quindi fare qualcosa che sembra veramente mettere una testa, dobbiamo invece ritornare ai diritti dell'uomo, e perciò dobbiamo mettere in discussione il nostro stile di vita e le politiche dell'Occidente per veramente fare un cambio culturale, politico, spirituale, gruppo economico verso la nostra vita e verso quella degli altri. Well, and what is most important in this uh, very discomforting scenario is to change our, the way we perceive this problem with uh, developing more policy, policies which are less selfish and more caring about uh, this, this country very much in need and, and the, the social problems of the people that reside there, so that uh, we, 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 we prove being more caring for, for our, you know, our other parts of the world that they need to help and, and support with our policies as well. It's really just a moment. Imagine that we are all of them. And to escape from the war, from the hunger, to confront the places where there is the risk of your life, of those children, delle mogli incinta per cambiare completamente la politica dell'Occidente. È solo il nostro ego che affonda l'intera umanità. It would be useful and very if we could be able to have empathy and to put ourselves in the condition of these poor people and uh, to maybe be a bit more aware of what uh, what is happening and, and change the policies, especially from rich countries toward the developing countries in a way that uh, there is more uh, bit more empathic and more caring in a way. This is something that I think should be pointed out as much as possible. A queste parole che vi ho detto, che sembrano semplici principi, senza poi entrare nel concreto, invece ora voglio entrare nel concreto, ma si parte da quei principi fondamentali, dove l'uomo è al centro. E ora possiamo parlare di che cosa fare, però se non partiamo dalla centralità dell'uomo, e da come noi abbiamo vissuto fino ad oggi, non riusciamo a percepire come dobbiamo cambiare. Well, the, main, the main issue should be our being aware of, the, of putting the human being in the center with the centrality of humanity to be in our policies as well, and in, in our way we deal with, uh, with 
global affairs. And if we are able to put uh, humanity in the center of, uh, of our policies, politics, and so on, then it will be much easier to, to work together toward a common positive objective for these, these issues. Thanks, Mr. Sino. I'm going to talk about the most important thing. Okay, okay. Ecco, io chiedo che il problema non deve restare assolutamente nel luogo dove si svolge. Allora, ecco, non può essere la Pegusa o la Sicilia o anche solo l'Italia. Già per esempio la comunità europea, proprio la parola comunità, che non sento incarnata nelle politiche della comunità europea, dei governi. Perciò chiedo, non lo sforzo, Chiedo che è proprio un dovere da parte di tutti i governi e perciò la comunità europea e dall'ONU anche che rappresenta proprio il pianeta deve partire la politica della condivisione del bene. Yeah, I would like to point out that this should not be seen only as a localized problem. It's not only Lampedusa or Sicily or the South of Italy or the South of European countries, obviously, that take the brunt of this, but it should be uh, discussed together collegially. For example, the European Union, the European um, S Union as such, uh, if it's a union really, then we should also be more sensitive together into this issue because uh, right now it, it all comes on, on, the, on, on the localized uh, problem, clearly. The same thing with the United Nations. United Nations means that the whole planet works together for common shared problems. So the institutions of the UN and, the, and, and our UN community should uh, not just, just point out to a particular crisis zone, but everybody together to change the policies, economic and political policies, to be less selfish and more sensitive to this, to the less fortunate among us. Allora, la prima cosa è l'accoglienza quando loro arrivano. E allora l'accoglienza è distribuita ovunque, in qualunque parte, perciò l'Europa tutta. Allora l'accoglienza è il primo punto, ma se non è abbinata a una politica economica verso i loro paesi, resta sempre l'assistenzialismo. E questo si deve aspettare, si aspetta con un'economia totalmente diversa di equità verso di loro. Obviously, right now what we are doing is we are just having a welcoming strategy, a welcoming refugees, which in reality is just a phase for the real problem, which is are us being more proactive with the economic development and social development of these countries which are much more in need of support from the international community. So I think we should just go at the root of the issue. When people in countries are more in need, we should be more supportive of them and their needs so that they can develop in a way that does not motivate them to desperately try to leave their countries. Allora, l'impegno di un'economia diversa, di pace verso il terzo mondo, ha abbinata anche a quella del proprio dell'impegno educativo e culturale, che stranamente vi può sembrare in questo momento, mentre parliamo di fame e di riscatto, al terzo mondo invece reputo quella educativa e culturale la vera rivoluzione che può cambiare completamente la mente dell'essere umano in qualunque parte del mondo. Perciò, questo aiuto qui diventa indispensabile per liberare, liberarci tutti. Qui non liberiamo loro, ci liberiamo noi. Well, obviously the, the main idea is to uh, <coughs> the most show, of course, less selfish, but also to facilitate greater education in the, in, uh, for these countries as well. And that's the way, not only to free these people who are much in need, but to free ourselves from, uh, from, 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 from economic and political models which are not obviously working over time, they are creating such big uh, tensions and uh, crisis at the moment. Thank you, thank you for all those who work with a lot of humanity in the world. In the United States, there are many people who have said before that they are really voluntary, they are extraordinary. Thank you to all those who do this work in the world, but we have to do this great change, particularly in the government of the nation. Well, I thank you very much on behalf of my city of Messina when we had many volunteers who worked very hard with this. Now, if I can add this personally, as myself, I was an active myself, so I give reason to the mayor. I worked with Caritas in the Sina, I did my military service there in the 1990s. And many of the activists now which are working in the city of Messina were working with me, refugees from the North Africa, back in the 1990s. With the, I, you know, we, we, were, we worked with the Knights of Holy Sepulchre, Javier Di Malta, at the time, and uh, this, this, there is a lot of uh, young people who really did their life for free 
and they give a lot of love to these people and respect them. And I think they should be commended. At least in Messina, I can confirm that. But that's important, please, Messina. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have more Skype? Um, other? Yes, I think this is another. Yes. Do we have uh, questions uh, from anybody in the audience? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, thank you. The overview is very interesting. And I understand from the mayor that things are in place for feeding people, temporary housing, temporary medical attention. But I would like to know if the various bodies mentioned here are working on a draft platform that can be presented to the European Union or to the other or to the national components within to deal with the refugee crisis. Yeah. I could respond to that quickly with some elements and then see the floor. And um, in, in many ways the elements both policy and operational that would be required within the European Union to respond to the to what is it, really what we're talking about here, this is not a new problem. What we're talking about here now is a very dramatic increase in numbers. So in many ways, the elements already exist. The question now, and I'm sure the colleague from Italy could speak to this in a more informed manner than I, the question now is how much political will there is within the Union to actually take the tools that already exist and really ensure a very um, a meaningful responsibility and burden sharing approach so that countries like Italy and Malta, which happen to be in the front line of current flows, are not left alone to deal with all of the consequences. Um, there are a number of initiatives underway. I mean, there was a, um, our colleague from Italy alluded a bit to some of the ongoing discussions both within the Union and between the European Union entities and organizations like UNHCR and, and IOM. From a UNHCR perspective, we will, um, in December of this year, through the use of our High Commissioner's Dialogue, which is an annual event that he convenes at his own initiative, this year's event will focus on the whole question of maritime movements and safety of life at sea. And it will bring together uh, member states, international organizations, the humanitarian side of the, the UN House, but also other very important players like the International Maritime Organization who have a lot to offer on the policy side. So that is one platform for discussion that is coming later in the year, and it's not the only one. There are several other initiatives on the go. But I think the main point I would like to underline in response to your question is many of the elements, the policy elements are already there. It's a question of ensuring that they're properly implemented. And from the operational side, I mean, clearly what is needed is um, a greater focus on material support, ensuring that there is proper funding, looking to ways and means of using available European um, Union funding lines to ensure that places like Italy and Malta do have the resources. Because if we just take a practical example, and I think we were hearing it there very clearly from the Mayor, where he was talking about the contribution of the NGOs and the willingness with which NGOs and civil society partners have responded. But in order to do that effectively, in order to meet all the material needs of these people arriving, of course there is an economic side to it as well. Things have to be paid for. Italy has just increased um, by quite a considerable margin its um, reception capacity in terms of being able to provide immediate housing to people arriving. But already we see that the rates of arrival are outstripping the increase in capacity. That has implications also for national budgets. So uh, I leave it at that. Perhaps the colleagues, the others on the panel would like to compliment. Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, things are moving very fast and they will definitely move in, the, in this next couple of months. Uh, Italy took the presidency of the Council, of the European Council on the 1st of July. Uh, this morning, just a couple of, of hours ago, our uh, Prime Minister gave his first speech to the European Parliament and uh, he, he, spoke, he spoke, he underlined very much the need of common and shared principles on, on basic, basic policies of the European Union and the uh, migration issue uh, will be one of our priorities. 
And uh, so immediately next week on the 8th and 9th of July, uh, in Rome, there will be a, a council of uh, an informal session, let's say, of the Council of Internal Affairs and Justice, where the European Commissioner uh, Cecilia Malmström will, will, will participate. And so they will immediately next week uh, sit around the table. So the Commissioner, our Minister of Interior, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, and all the stakeholders uh, to try to, to again. Uh, tackle the issue on a more operative uh, uh, way uh, because from a political point of view instruments and tools already exist and I definitely think that uh, in, the, in, the, in the Italian semester of the presidency uh, we, we will be able to, to strengthen uh, even more this collective political will of, uh, of the Union. So things are really moving fast. And just just to add a last point, uh, last year as this was gaining more attention, I mean we had we'd raised International Migrants Day is December 18th, and we released a, a a message looking at the the number of deaths that had occurred, looking and we we're calling it desperation migration, and and what migrants will do in order to migrate, and the ways in which that they risk their lives and lose their lives, and in their journey, a number of the elements I um. I presented were actually um, discussed and presented by IOM to the EU, and discussions are, are ongoing. I mean, as, as both my colleagues said, there are a number of tools and frameworks that are already in place. Sometimes what is lacking is enough political will by all parties to help the political respond. Thank you very much for the answer. The question. Uh, do we have another connection? Yes, well, and, uh, we, we have uh, also a connection with uh, the city of Messina, with there's some of the activists there that uh, are present. Giuseppe, c'è molto more. Dunque, on this is actually Giuseppe Garullo, is one of the activists that's working right now in the city of Messina with the refugees. I would like to point out to you, if you see there behind him, there's Messina, 40, 40 anni in Europa. 40 years of Europe. We are the European Association, so we'd like to point out that the first meeting for the formation of the European Union was in 1955 with Foreign Minister Antonio Martino, uh, and it was the beginning of the, of, the, of the process of the European Union before the Treaty of Rome, and so we see that the symbolic uh, um, the history of the, the creation of the European Union uh, back after the Second World War, which was the first step that we took together in Europe to avoid the wars uh, uh, because of economic reasons. And uh, so it's, it's actually a gate to Europe also for, in a way, historical gate for migrants, obviously, and, and people that want to know uh, Europe coming from, from around the world historically. Giuseppe, se tu hai delle statistiche per caso, do you have any statistics that you would like to present? Senti, Giuseppe, ci sei? Are you there? Sì, Vuoi dire qualcosa che condividiamo qua? Would you like to say something you can share with people here? No, diciamo che mi piace molto eh, questa, questa immagine perché ci ricorda che qui a Messina è nata l'Europa praticamente, tanti anni fa, come dicevi un attimo fa, tu, eh, è nata l'Europa e adesso l'Europa deve aiutare Messina a risolvere questa emergenza. Okay, he just we have also point out the theory. Mi piace avere a fianco questa immagine che ricorda tutto che l'Europa è nata qui e l'Europa deve ritrovarsi di noi sicuramente. I think you also say something a bit obviously from from this point of view. Exactly this day would like to say yes, this is the door to Europe. Europe was born here, united, but Europe should not forget about us. What he's saying is that uh, you know we, we are the door to Europe still from the from the the North Africa and the Middle East and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we hope that the rest of the European Union does not forget that we, as one of the founding uh, cities of the, of, the, of the Union, should not be forgotten in our sacrifices, should need to some support from the rest of the continent as well. But I think I share this with you. Okay, I'll confirm it. We'll be with you. Yes, but another way, so we'll talk about our history, the history of the European Union, because di questi nostri fratelli eh, immigrati che scappano da guerre, da fame, da, da sofferenze. Eh, la città è sempre stata molto vicina a queste persone, sempre accolto con amore, addirittura appena si sa che arriva un, un 
pullman o una nave carica di questi nostri amici, eh, i, i, i nostri amici, i nostri amici di Messina si vanno a trovare lì al porto con delle sacche piene di, di vestiti, di scarpe. E questa cosa è una cosa bella, quanta si commovente. Ci rendiamo conto però che... Ma poi si dice, devi, devi fermarsi, se no non ce la faccio. So I'd like to say to thank you very much, uh, uh, obviously for, for allowing me to present uh, some statistics for our work here with migrants. Messina since October of last year has really been one of the main entry ports for our, our brothers from uh, more in need from around the world that come through the city. And I want to say that many of the citizens have been particularly sensitive to this issue. And it's not um, surprising that when a new ship or a new um, bus uh, comes with migrants, citizens uh, put clothes and and, and, uh, and shoes and all kind of items together to bring it to them and to help them. And now this is nothing new, as I, as I said myself, as an NGO activist in the 1990s, we would do this back then. But back then, migrants from, from Middle East and North Africa, about four, three, four people a day, you would see, see no more. Now it's a different level, obviously. Okay, we'll look at what. Okay. Stavo aggiungendo che questa è l'accoglienza dei messinesi, associazioni, movimenti come il nostro, che sono quelli che abbiamo fatto leggere il nostro sindaco, stiamo dando una mano a queste persone. Ma mi rendo conto che dopo tanti mesi di arrivi, adesso che sono veramente tanti questi nostri fratelli che sono arrivati, la gente comincia a, 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 come dite, a diventare quasi nazista, purtroppo. Ed è una cosa molto triste. Ci sono episodi di nazismo che mi hanno raccontato alcuni di questi ragazzi e che denotano una certa sofferenza forse nel sottotitolo della città. Ecco perché gli diamo aiuto. Dunque, it's okay. This is actually very important. I think we should take this very seriously. What, what, uh, what Giuseppe is saying is that um, the city, uh, as many other locations in Europe, have been very sensitive to migrants historically. I mean, in Italy especially, we are a country of migrants. In America, the country that hosts us, there is so many uh, of us who came here, myself too, since the 1980s, and uh, my migrating from, from Europe. And it's not Italian, it's also Irish, it's also British, it's also German, as a matter of fact, uh, Swedish and, 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 and like nationalities. But what's happening in Europe now is that the numbers are being so large that volunteers that have never seen this are noticing now a social reaction which in, includes racism and insensitivity because of the limited resources and the lack of coordination. We have seen this also in the political reaction in Europe, as you know, with some of the more extreme parties taking major positions in European major countries which would be unheard of 10 or 15 years ago. So in this regard, we think it should be important that the international community coordinates more to provide support uh, for uh, and coordinates on how to address this issue because the social and the political impact is very scary and there is uh, some there is a bird of racism and it's sensitivity to which we are not used. Sempre dobbiamo interrompere però, siamo fuori tempo. Isaac, you have to stop very quickly. Sempre ti ringrazio di non interrompere perché siamo fuori tempo. Ma lo sapete dire una cosa brevissima, il fatto è che questa gente sa ancora di detente quando noi abbiamo tantissimi spazi che potremmo utilizzare ma in qualche maniera non ci vengono concessi questi spazi, quindi potremmo accoglierli in maniera ancora più efficace. Comunque io ringrazio veramente voi, grazie Giuseppe. Eh, grazie a voi Giuseppe, grazie a Clelia Marano per il suo aiuto, anche non è venuta oggi, ma sappiamo che è un attivista sì, che già sì. con me, con la ragazza dell'accoglienza Aurelio, si lavorava tantissimo per i poveri gli ultimi, mi piace che non sia venuta, ma grazie a Cacleria, e grazie a Rada Corinti, grazie a tutti voi che fate questo impegno per l'umanità. Grazie di nuovo, ciao alle relazioni. Grazie, va bene. Grazie a tutti, grazie a tutti. Siamo la più onore di voi, Fanny Mobili e Gilles Bessi, per l'opportunità di share questi pensi e questi pensi. Grazie a tutti. Grazie a tutti. Grazie a tutti. Grazie a tutti. And we want to extend a special thanks as well to Tessa, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and Mr. Amin Lamrabat for his continuous support as well to us for making these events happen. Um, you know, again, we're very honored to be here, and we appreciate everybody's attendance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.